Good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to our ninth webinar. I'm Muriel Finkel from Amyloidosis Support Group. If you have uh, not seen our previous webinars or would like to re-watch them, they can be seen on our website, amyloidosissupport.org. We have a webinar link you can click on and scroll down. And we also have a YouTube channel for amyloidosis support groups where you can see our previous webinars. Be sure and uh, join, join us on the uh, YouTube channel. We really would like it if, if you do register for that. That would be great. Um, okay, today's webinar uh, should be up there in a couple of weeks. We hope to be able to resume live meetings sometime in 2022. We'll probably be still doing some webinars though. They've really gone over well and we can reach a nice wide variety of people that way. Uh, we realize that the main thing lacking from the webinars is the patient to patient contact. And, but we find that our Facebook groups take care of that pretty well. So if you haven't joined our Facebook groups, we have one for all types of amyloidosis. So we do encourage you to join Facebook for that. I know some people are kind of have an aversion to Facebook and we get that, but you can, our group is private. We vet the people that join. And so it's all pretty much on the up and up in those groups. Uh, right now in the control room today, we have our, our executive director, Paula Schmidt. She's waving to us. And we have our special projects director, Bob Gibson. And Bob, yep. Bob I, I know that we don't want people writing anything in the chat today, but we do want them to uh, put, put their questions in the Q&A box, but we want them to do that anonymously so they, you know, so they have the option of not people not knowing who they are. How do they do that? Uh, hi. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for attending. Yes, to uh, put in a question anonymously. When you open up the Q&A icon, which uh, should be on your screen, if you're on the computer, it'll be uh, on the bottom slot there, uh, maybe in different locations, depending on it, whether you're accessing this through um, an iPad or, or a mobile device. Uh, but anyway, when you open up the Q&A box, you will see in the bottom, generally left-hand corner, there's a checkbox, which uh, says, ask anonymously. We would like you to use that checkbox and send in your question anon anonymously, just so that we can uh, preserve the privacy of the questions being asked. So please check that box and then submit the question uh, with a little uh, button there that says submit. Uh, and you should be fine uh, on that. Thank you, Bob. And we'll, we'll be answering, well, I won't be, we'll have our panel of experts answering that later on. We bring a super high qualified group of experts to you today to help us gain a few coping skills. Uh, joining our panel today is Dr. Isidore Berenbaum from Boston University. And also from Boston University is Dr. Jennifer McMahon. And to, and to finish at Boston University, we have uh, Robert David. Other panelists are Nico Cheek O'Donnell from Huntsman in Salt Lake City, and Dr. Timer Scher, the head of the amyloidosis clinic at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. Dr. Scher may be a little late in joining us live. He's rounding today, so we don't want to keep him from his patients. Uh, rounding out the group will be Jessica Edwards from the National Alliance of Mental Illness, known as NAMI. And Jessica will have some resources for us. We'll start today hearing from our guests and then we'll take some questions. We'll finish off with a few words from Jessica Edwards. Um, again, she was pre-recorded as she couldn't be with us today. At the end of the webinar, there'll be a short survey, which we really implore you to take. These surveys help us in planning future webinars. Okay, so take it away, Dr. Berenbaum. I want to uh, welcome all of you, and uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, you're all joining us and here, and I hope that I and my colleagues uh, can be of help to you. 
Um, I wish I, you know, I'm an old timer, as you can see, and uh, I love the, always the interaction in the groups uh, with both the amyloid and caretakers, significant others. And uh, the truth of the matter is, is, as much as I try to share and help you guys, uh, you've been extraordinary in helping me. Um, and in over 20 years of working with amyloidosis at BU, uh, one thing that has struck me, and I think it's especially true now uh, in the environment of COVID, um, you know, the tragic shootings that have occurred throughout the country, uh, dealing with amyloid, which is a life-threatening illness, chronic illness, uh, I've just been struck in groups and in dealing with families uh, of your courage and your resilience in dealing with this. Uh, and it's uh, really inspired me and uh, my team, my fellows have always remarked about that. So I thank you all for being here today. Um, when Muriel asked uh, me to join you to talk a little about mental health issues in regards to amyloidosis, uh, truly the webinar and what we're all doing today is probably the most important coping tool. Uh, and the coping is, as you would know, is really remaining connected, uh, people helping each other and really not being isolated. That is truly the most important thing uh, that gets us through this disease. Um, I've been involved in since the inception of the amyloid program at BU, uh, initially with Martha Skinner and Dave Selden, and now Vishali Sanchawala. And they included psychiatry uh, because they really felt the psychological issues in dealing with amyloidosis uh, was paramount in coping and getting through the disease, both through treatment and after that. Um, and I just want to make some comments, and I hope my colleagues, uh, both uh, Dr. McMahon, uh, Bob, David, and Nico will share their own experiences of what they've uh, found in dealing with amyloidosis. And uh, I just want to touch about, upon a few things, because I really do want to keep the meeting to have more questions and answers and really meet your needs in that way. Um, there's a study that we did uh, over 20 years, and uh, it involved over 1,200 patients. And uh, not surprising, there was a significant number of those patients uh, that had both depression and anxiety. Um, depression occurred in probably one third of the patients, and anxiety and anxiety issues were probably close to a half. And uh, just to give you a framework, when we talk about anxiety, uh, it's thinking about it in relation to anticipatory fears. You know, coming to uh, a program, getting the diagnosis of amyloid, uh, all the anticipation you have in getting the treatment and what happens after that, uh, that can result in both panic, anxiety uh, during that time. Um, and you get help in dealing with that, let alone, especially with setbacks, the trauma that you go through, and certainly the post-traumatic effects later on. And that's something people talked about uh, when questioned about the issues of anxiety. The other thing that I want to put in context, and I hope others uh, talk a little about it, is what we mean by depression. And uh, when we talk about depression, uh, I want to separate that from what you see uh, certain entities. One is something called demoralization. Um, people come in and kind of lose a sense of themselves, lose meaning to their life. Uh, how competent am I in dealing with this illness dealing with all the bodily changes that occur and the somatic symptoms that occur. And I, I just wanted to give you a quick example. Uh, we had one patient a number of years ago 
who was a professor in a college in a different country, came here and we were asked to see him because people thought he was depressed. And he was dealing with the side effects of the disease and the treatment. And uh, what became apparent is he talked about how he felt so isolated, separated from his family, but also not sure of what the meaning to his life was. And our interaction was pretty brief. We helped him with his sleep and gave him some medication for that. But the most important thing that we began to do is I asked him to tell me the story of his life. And he began to share what was meaningful in his life, his accomplishments, things that he was proud of. And honestly, within a few days, uh, he was different, much more hopeful and much more engaged. So there's an entity of demoralization. Uh, the other entity is the somatic symptoms that occur with the disease. You know, sometimes we'll get called uh, about someone being depressed and we come in and see them and they are huddled in bed, covers over their head. And when we talk to them, uh, they're just suffering. They're having nausea, vomiting, somatic symptoms, they're tired and they withdraw from their families and everyone gets worried. And as I've talked about it with people, it's something we call conservation withdrawal. Someone and people, you, if you've been through this, you're conserving your energy. You're trying to survive and this is the body's way of doing it. And even though you appear withdrawn, all of these patients will tell you they maintain their hope. And that really differentiates that from depression. Um, the last thing I wanted to describe is grief and something we call anticipatory grief. You know, you hear a lot about amyloid, you hear a lot about disease. What am I gonna lose? Am I gonna be left alone? Am I not gonna be able to work? And all the losses, the anticipation of those losses, in a sense, you're grieving. And that's very, very normal. The sadness, the worry about that, uh, it's not pathologic, it's not depression. So I just wanted to highlight those three things to help put in context what people go through. Um, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut right now and uh, let Dr. McMahon go on as far as her work. And I hope I can be of help in the answers uh, for questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Berenbaum. We look forward to hearing more from you. And Dr. McMahon, uh, you're up next. Hi, everyone. I, I thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I, um, I'm Dr. McMahon. I also work at Boston Medical Center. I uh, am a psychiatry fellow there. And I primarily see uh, patients um, who have uh, medical illnesses um, and you know, need more assistance for things like depression, anxiety, difficulty sleeping, that sort of thing. Um, I see patients both in the hospital um, and, and outside the hospital and in the outpatient environment as well. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about my experiences um, with the patients that I see, you know, kind of the, the typical thing that um, we might talk about in, in a session. Um, a lot of people, you know, say to me, they're not quite sure what to expect when they speak to a psychiatrist or, or what sort of things we might be able to offer. Um, so I'm just going to review, you know, what we would uh, typically talk about maybe in, in our first session together. Um, we, are, of course, would start off with whatever is um, bothering you the most. Sometimes people are saying and they feel depressed. Sometimes they feel anxious it's, or it's, it's trouble sleeping. Um, but like Dr. Berenbaum mentioned, there's many other symptoms that people experience. Um, often it's things like uh, poor motivation, really just kind of not feeling like their normal self before they became ill, um, having difficulty concentrating, um, sort of having racing thoughts or, you know, kind of ruminating about things and this is affecting their sleep. 
Um, and there are many other symptoms that go with depression, um, like feeling hopeless or helpless, um, you know, feeling very uh, withdrawn. Um, and so we might talk about all these different things that you are experiencing. Um, and this is very common uh, thing that I see in many different uh, patients. Uh, many people also talk about kind of their uh, uh, lack of control uh, and now being sick, um, as well as not having to adjust to maybe needing more help um, than they previously did. Um, many people, you know, are used to being able to go to work, um, you know, or maybe uh, running their household and things have needed to change um, after their medical illness. Uh, we often explore things like the, the meaning of illness. How do you feel about your diagnosis? Um, what's, what's the hardest for you? Uh, what has surprised you about it? Um, you know, what, do, what do you see in the future? Uh, what are you concerned about the future or hopeful about in the future? Uh, we might explore different coping styles that people have, um, especially kind of reviewing things like what, what challenges have, had, have you had in the past? Um, you know, how have you, you dealt with that? What worked well for you? Um, what, what didn't work well? And, and starting to kind of incorporate that into, uh, you know, how, how you can deal with your current situation. Uh, we often talk about how, you know, where do you go for support? Um, you know, what family members or friends or providers that, that you are, are really in your network? Um, you, know, you know, and how um, do you feel comfortable in confiding in them? Uh, many people talk about stressors in their life, you know, in addition to their, their illness, you know, they might be moving, they might no longer be working, they have uh, financial concerns as well. Um, that's a typical thing that we might talk about. Uh, some people have, you know, seen psychiatry in the past and maybe in the past they've had uh, episodes where they felt depressed or they've struggled with anxiety throughout their life. Um, that's very common, but it's also common that this is the first time somebody's seeing a psychiatrist and, and this is new to them. Um, sometimes people have been on particular medication in the past for their mood or anxiety or sleep, and we might review what's been helpful for you in the past. Um, and, you know, is this something to consider again? Um, we also will review things like your, your other medications. Sometimes other medications might be affecting, um, you know, your sleep or your mood. Um, we also review things like, um, you know, alcohol or substances, uh, which that can also impact, uh, negatively impact somebody's mood as well. And that's something we would, we would discuss. Um, and lastly, of course, we discuss what, what would be helpful. Sometimes people, you know, might meet with us initially and don't feel like they need to regularly follow up with us right now, but might come back in the future when things are a little bit more stressful. Some people are interested in talking about uh, medications, which is an option. Um, and if some people are less interested in medication and might want to engage more in therapy, and often people choose both and, and find both options helpful for them. Um, and I also do want to highlight that, you know, we see um, psychiatry is often available um, in the hospital as well. Um, and so often we will see people um, once they're, when they're admitted to the hospital because they might be going through, obviously some more acute stressors right then um, and are interested in, in talking to psychiatry um, in that situation. Um, and I guess just to summarize, you know, that's, it, it's an, an important thing to kind of reach out to your doctors and ask what's available, um, you know, if you're interested in, in seeing psychiatry um, and have them either refer you to, you know, a psychiatrist in the outpatient or, or in the inpatient um, hospital setting. Um, 
and uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing all of your questions. Um, and again, I'm gonna keep this short as well um, so we can kind of move on and hear what other people have to say, but also hoping to be able to focus more on your questions and, and talk to you about what interests you the most. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McMahon. Um, and next we'll hear from Bob, Bob David. Um, hi, thank you, Muriel. <clears throat> So my experience over the past mm, 25 years has been uh, running a lot of support groups of various types. And the last half of that time has been um, mostly with cancer and amyloidosis patients. And um, I, I learn a lot. It's such a privilege for me really to, to sit in the room with people who have uh, going through these experiences. The amyloidosis groups um, at Boston Medical, up until COVID times, it really has taken a break since then, but it was a weekly meeting um, for people coming in. And every week it would be a different group, although sometimes the same people would come back six months or a year later. And there's a good chance that out of the uh, 200 people at this meeting right now, I, I've probably met several of you, if not more. But um, through, my, through observations, basically, and listening to people, um, I find there are a lot of themes that come up um, in the caregiver patient relationship and dynamic that are <laughs> very universal, really. And my feeling is that um, <clears throat> they, these dynamics play a, uh, a significant role in the uh, emotional well being of both the patient and the caregiver during this difficult journey. Um, so I, I would just like to touch uh, briefly on a few uh, kind of universal things that come up, uh, if I might, and they really involve the, the, the caregiver, but also to some extent the, the patient. But one, one, one area is asking for help. Oh yeah, before I, I talk about that, I want to say that um, everybody, it's a unique journey for everybody, and sometimes we fall into ruts. And if you're in a rut, that's okay. That's kind of normal, but you can get out of it. And what I like to encourage, say encouraging to people is um, whatever, whatever situation you have, it can be changed. It's really a matter of communication and maybe um, thinking of a new way to communicate around something. So one area, as I said, is asking for help. And this is really for the caregiver. Um, it's good to take to receive help at the beginning to accept some offers of help at the beginning because you may not get them after that when you need them more. But even later on, if you feel you really need help from a family member or a friend, you can ask for it. And I would suggest doing it this way. Um, thinking first how you will ask and then um, Asking it in such a way, calling up somebody saying, you know, I'm, I'm calling you to see if you might be able to help me and put it out there in a way that there's no expectation, there's no demand, but you're just saying clearly in a detailed way what it is you could use help with. And it makes it easier for the listener to really listen and hear it and not worry about, oh, what am I going to be asked to do or can I do it or whatever. They just listen. And if they can't help you, it's easier for them to say, I can't help you now. And, and it's easier for you to accept it. But what might happen later is they're going to think about that and they're going to appreciate your request and they may check in with you later or they may find that they can help you a little bit later. So the likelihood of getting some help is, is greatly increased. Um, another area I want to touch on briefly is uh, the area of boundaries. Um, as Dr. Baron Baum uh, pointed out, you know, patients go through all kinds of things. Physically, they don't feel well. Um, emotionally, they don't feel well. Uh, cognitively, they may not be functioning at their best. They may have these spiritual questions, you know, uh, what, what, what if I can never work again? Or, you know, what's, you know, self-worth questions, uh, which are normal during this time. Um, but the side effect of that is there, if you don't feel well, you, you'll lash out sometimes, you know, you say things that with a lot of anger and frustration behind them. And the person that usually gets that is the person that 
it's easiest to lash out against the person you feel safest with, and that's your primary caregiver, often your spouse. Um, but it's not really a healthy thing or a good thing for either of you to go through that. So a simple solution I find is to simply walk out of the room say, and say, you know, I'm going to, if the, if the patient, you know, goes off on a diatribe or something, um, say, I, I'm going to leave the room now. And that gives them a moment to like, think about what they're doing, what they're saying, and maybe reframe it a bit. And you can come back later. Um, and the message always being, you know, the message you give verbally or in your behavior is, I know you're having a hard time and I know you need to vent sometimes and I will always listen to you. But if you go overboard and start blaming me, I'm going to leave the room. Now, the benefits of handling it that way are, if you don't, that first scenario where the patient flies off, and then of course they're going to apologize later, but they feel guilty they, because they know you don't deserve it. So they're going to feel guilty and then, then they apologize to you and then you accept and then you go on. But it's more likely to happen again because it's this, pat, this set of behavior has been kind of legitimized. So they may do it again and then, you know, whatever, it goes on and on. And it's not a good thing because the patient feels bad enough as it is, they don't need these feelings of guilt. So um, better to kind of check it at the beginning and have a safety valve where you can walk out of the room and then give the message, I'll always listen to you because I do know what you're going, you know, I do understand you're really suffering and struggling. Um, but if it goes overboard, then I'm gonna whack out. Um, one other area I'll touch on for now is this uh, aspect of independence. And this is universal also. Patients, you know, they go through treatment, it's kind of understood, everything is on hold. Everybody knows that. Um, but after treatment, or maybe as the treatment's gotten more routine and, and you've both learned to cope well with it, patient starts to get restless and wants to, uh, you know, spread his or her wings a little bit and go back to doing some normal things. And of course, as caregiver, you're very concerned that the patient doesn't overdo it. Um, so you're, 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 you're ultra cautious and they're wanting to take some risk. Um, and it can be another frustrating dynamic. You know, she won't let me do such and such. She's nagging or whatever, or he, whatever the case may be. And so I just want to um, encourage the caregiver to take to heart the patient's need for some independence. And, you know, I think we all understand that, that we all know our own limits better than anybody else. And when we've been down for a while, we need to kind of check things out. So your message might be to your wife who planted some azaleas last year, and now there are wild onions coming up over the winter time between the azaleas. This is, <laughs> I just had this experience. And now she wants to go out and pull up those onions, those wild onions that have sprouted up. And you know that you have to dig pretty deep to get those things out and it's a lot of work and you're concerned and you don't really, you're not so sure your wife should do this now, but she wants to do it. So what do you do? Do you, you know, well, you can say, um, well, are you sure you want to do this? And the wife says, yes. Um, well, um, do you want me to help you? She says, no, no, I can handle it. Then your message can be something like, well, okay, take care of yourself. Be careful. Um, you know you can stop at any time. And if you need help, just call me. And then give them the freedom to test their limits. And you know, if she hits a wall after 10 minutes, then she's going to know it and she'll stop on her own. If she succeeds for 15 or 20 minutes, that's going to feel good. She tested her, her limits and had some positive self-feedback on that. It's very, very critical to a person's sense of self-worth, uh, sense of independence. So um, just a few things that basically, out of my observation and uh, things that come up over and over and over again in these groups. And by the way, at the support groups at Boston Medical, uh, caregivers are always welcome, and more often than not, caregivers and patients attend together. So if you do have a support group in your area, I certainly recommend 
that you participate. And that's, that's enough for me now. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. As I was listening to you, I was thinking, yeah, it's easy for the caregiver to walk out of the room. Sometimes it's not that easy for the patient to walk out of the room. So uh, there's a little advantage there. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, next we're going to hear from Nico Chico Donnell from Huntsman in uh, Salt Lake City. So Nico, take it away. Yeah, hi. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a social worker. I work with uh, cancer patients and amyloidosis patients, and um, and sometimes my role is is kind of hard to define or um, <clears throat> one that isn't immediately clear to uh, the p new patients that I meet. Um, uh, I I actually kind of conceptualize my role a little bit as a um, like a tandem skydiver. Um, so I'm the, I'm the guy who works for the skydiving company who um, would be strapped in with uh, the patient. Um, and uh, as we're <clears throat> uh, being thrown out of the plane uh, and falling uh, towards the earth, I um, would stay connected to the patient through that. And um, it would be my, my job to uh, pull the string uh, for the parachute if the patient needs um, help doing that. And of course, if that parachute doesn't work, doesn't work well enough, then there's an emergency parachute and my job is to know about that, pull that. Um, and, uh, um, and then after the whole thing's over, uh, that <clears throat> apparatus that we use, um, and maybe the, the suits that we're wearing and all that, I take it back and I clean them. Um, and uh, it can get a little messy, the, those suits, I imagine. I've never been skydiving, actually. But, um, and, and that's kind of a, a, a little bit of a... Uh, snapshot of how I see my role as a social worker. It's, it's really just to be somebody who is connected to the patient at a time where um, that might be something that is really, um, you know, in, in great need. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as, um, you know, specifically the social worker role, we tend to be in the hospital um, uh, at all at all times, especially during you know work hours. Um, we tend to be available on short notice, so you don't have to make an appointment with us. Um, uh, we tend not to bill uh, separately for our services, and and that means that um, you know it doesn't have to be just the patient who. Um, you know, meets with us who we work with. It can be the caregiver, the family member, um, what have you. We're not, we don't have any need to justify the, the work to some kind of insurance company or anything like that. We um, will work with the family unit um, in whatever way is helpful. Um, and so I, I think that it, for those of you who haven't maybe um, you know worked with this social worker, it, it's something to um, I, 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 it might be something to benefit you and it might be something worth checking out. Uh, and I guess that's what I would say for now. Thank you so much, Nico. And Dr. Dr. Sher, are you are you rounding or are you with us for a few minutes here? I am here. If you can uh, hear and see me, we can. We can. You look. You look a little different than the last time I saw you. I do. You know, I have a. This is the COVID syndrome, right? <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you so very much, Muriel. It's an honor and pleasure. Um, so, I'm a hematologist at Mayo Clinic in Florida, and uh, had an honor and privilege of um, running a multidisciplinary uh, amyloidosis clinic 
uh, I see essentially, you know, we tell people that there are 35 different types of amyloid, but I think, you know, I have seen it, it uh, types which are beyond that. So, you know, technically and practically, theoretically, any protein can turn into amyloid. So my two cents into the theme today of uh, what we are um, listening, uh, a few minutes as to how I see when a patient comes to me and I see uh, um, the interaction with the patient and the family, and I try to tell that to that interaction is that, you know, we have to look at disease and illness. If there is a mindset that we will cure this, you know, both AL amyloid or different types, sometimes uh, we as patients and family members get lost into that word cure. So I do try to come up and say, you know, the response to the treatment and all those things are very important, but it's important that we don't get lost in that word cure. And we look at the word illness. And illness, we can heal almost everybody. You know, we as physicians can talk to people, you can talk to us, you can talk to your loved one and family members and feel relieved, feel relieved of the burden of the symptoms. So if the, that mindset is important. At least that's the way I approach things as a physician when I deal with patients or I see patients. Um, another concept I have that I try to talk to them is that try not to get lost into those numbers too much. Because this is where we all end up losing too much precious time as to you know, what's happening to my this number or to my that number. It's important to keep the big picture in mind. And as all of my esteemed colleagues have alluded to, to have that sense, you know, we are humans, we need everybody to support us. Now, from the patient side, what I see as an opportunity, when you see your providers, it's important to share all these concerns. Because, uh, you know, physicians, they are humans too. They want to get connected with the patients beyond just the numbers. Unfortunately, that interaction time is limited. But the more people come up and say, these are my important issues, these are my priorities, how can we address them? For example, you know, uh, many of my patients with AL, when I see them, we don't necessarily talk about the light chains. We talk about what's important in life. You know, it's somebody's uh, wedding anniversary, somebody's birthday. That's what's important for us to reach as the next goal. We work towards that. So having a broader horizon of thinking of life as a whole and amyloid as part of it. I think that's important. Medically in this field of, in this arena of amyloidosis, I can tell you that there has never been a better time to be with living with this disease. Uh, there are so many things happening in almost all major types. So about 99% of different types of amyloidosis, remarkable progress is being made. So uh, there is clearly a lesson of hope there. Uh, I do believe that it's important that during the course of your journey, uh, patients with these uh, uh, specialized diseases must uh, get in touch with people who know about it at least once so that they are comfortable in discussing their uh, understanding, their perceptions, and um, discussing you know, the, their concerns. And then the treatment can be done locally with you know, the cardiologists, with nephrologists, with different specialties. But it's important that at some stage in the course of the illness, you, you try to connect with somebody who has expertise in this disease. And you know, I'm not gonna take a long time. We're all here for your questions. That's what we are anxiously waiting for. So um, we'll be happy to answer anything. Muriel and Paula, they all know my contact. We'll be happy to answer and address anything that comes up. Thank you so much. And I do have a question for you right now, Dr. Shear, <clears throat> since you, you're going to be in and out because I know you have uh, patients that you're rounding with. So I do want to ask you kind of an elephant in the room question in regards to COVID. We see this come up in our Facebook group all the time. People are concerned because they have a disease. Uh, it, 
AL amyloidosis or ATTR amyloidosis, that the COVID vaccine will not be as effective for them as it would be for someone who does not have this condition, especially people on daratumumab uh, for the AL group or Cyborg-D or people on Vindamax or whatever for TTR or on Patro or whatever. So what do you have to say about the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine for these patients? Mm -hmm. So that's a very important question. And the uh, obviously, you know, in the field of medicine, we have to guide our answers based on data. So there is not much very clear data as to patients with these vaccines being studied in a randomized fashion. You know, that's the ultimate thing. I can tell you a little bit of um, information that's coming that generally speaking, cancer patients, so which, you know, AL patients tend to belong to that category, have a much higher propensity to get a more severe disease. We know that in general patient population, people who have heart failure from any cause, people who have kidney disease from any cause, they are high risk patients to get the disease and suffer from its uh, more severe form and complications. We have this piece of information. Then another piece of information which is coming to us now from patients who are immunosuppressed, um, cancer patients who have lymphomas, for example, which is a distant cousin of AL amyloid, when we treat them with monoclonal antibody like rituxin or rituximab, it's a fairly commonly used drug. Uh, similar uh, in some respect to daratumumab, you know, we know that that drug depletes the B cells, the cells which ultimately are tasked with forming antibodies. So B cells, you think of like as the infantry of the immune system. So generals, they do the planning. If I'm attacked by COVID or I'm attacked by this bacteria or that bacteria, they send down the message to the infantry and say, hey, fire or attack. That infantry cell is a plasma cell and they are very closely related to B cells. So rituximab, what we have seen is that people who are getting rituxin for different indications, if they end up getting COVID, uh, they get more severe illness. So as a result of some of those information, we have modified the treatment protocols a little bit, but does that mean that the patient on rituxin should not get the vaccine? Answer is no. So here I would go back to the, uh, you know, the, the conventional wisdom behind the flu season. So cancer patients who have stem cell transplantation, who have multiple chemotherapy drugs, we tell them, please do get your flu vaccine because some protection is better than none. So if any of the disease puts us as high risk of having COVID or its complication, yes, vaccine may not be very effective, but it will definitely uh, afford us some protection. Now, what that level of protection is, that's debatable. We don't know that, not much data out of that. Uh, but the currently available RNA-based vaccines or other vaccines, protein-based, which are killed vaccine, not an active vaccine, live vaccine, uh, they should all be safe in terms of uh, like in general population. Uh, how I'm approaching it with my patients, I'm encouraging them that please get it because I think in the long run, it will decrease the chance that you will get the virus. And number two, it will decrease the chance that you will get a severe disease if you do get the virus. Thank you very much. That was really helpful. And I know a lot of people are, are grateful for that response. Okay, here's a question. I, I guess we'll start with Dr. Um, Berenbaum on this. This is a real big loaded question here, but and I don't know if there's any one answer, but you can try. Uh, how do I deal with the loss of hope Dr. Berenbaum? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. I think the loss of hope uh, at times occurs throughout the disease for all of us uh, who experience the disease. And I, I think the important thing is for people to differentiate between loss of hope or hopelessness and helplessness. Uh, am I feeling helpless that I can't do the things, uh, sort of as Bob described, can someone pull out their plants? Can they do their job? Or have I lost hope where I just want to die and I want to give up? And those thoughts will go through your mind at times. Um, I think the key thing is anytime you're beginning to lose hope, 
as you heard from Dr. Sher, you need to find the people who can kind of get your head on straight again um, to let you know about your disease, let you know and re reassure you that you're not alone in dealing with this. When I find people lose hope, it's more those who are feeling isolated and not connected or feeling very, very guilty about having the disease, being a burden to others and feeling that they're hurting their family and others. Um, the other part of loss of hope is that it relates to where you are in your life. Uh, have there been other times when you've gone through that and is there a snowball effect of what's occurring? Uh, but it's really making sure, I think the most important thing is not doing this alone and connecting. And if there is evidence more of a depression that's interfering with your treatment, it may even require a medication at that time. Thank you. When you say medication, okay, um, I, I realize that that's a, there's going to be a hundred different medications that one has for anxiety and depression and, and stress. And, you know, and I, you know, and I know some people are pill poppers and some don't want to take anything even when they, when they should. But when, when we talk about medication, um, prescription medication, are there any, is there anything over the counter that people can take? Do you, do you, is there ever anything over the counter? Well, you know, we, we talked about it before over the, you know, people self-medicate themselves, alcohol, marijuana, uh, God bless you. You know, people use a lot of different things. Uh, I would just be very careful, very wary in talking to your physician. Uh, one thing that I always ask, and uh, Jennifer may uh, find this to be the case, is sleep is a very sensitive indicator of how you're doing. And the most important thing is making sure you get a good night's rest. And it, sleep will tell you what level of anxiety or mood change that occurred. Uh, so we will provide some medication, uh, mirtazapine, others that can be of help. Uh, but please, please be careful when using other substances. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and Paula, thank you. Paula put into the chat uh, rooms the links for the Facebook group for, and we appreciate that. So when you have a chance, you can go in there and see those links. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, well, this next one, I, I, I kind of want to steer clear of, of questions that are strictly, you know, about medications that don't relate to um, emotional or mental health, but we will get back to those and we'll, we can certainly ask Dr. Sher about them. Uh, Nico, um, this might be a question for you. I've had to start Pomalist on top of Dara recently. It alone costs more than my income. I did get a grant from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society of $11,000, but that leaves a balance of $18,000 of life-saving medicine. It's very depressing, I would think so, right? And makes me wanna just give up. How do I cope? Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, reach out to your social worker um, or other, um, support staff in the hospital where they're working with. Um, and uh, they may be able to connect you, you know, even if the social worker can't answer the question directly, part of their role is to help you navigate the system and, and help connect you with um, somebody who, who would have the answer. And, and um, you know, they can be your uh, guide in, in, in trying to navigate uh, the hospital system. In, in this particular case, um, I actually happen to know that um, for Pomalist, um, no matter, regardless of your income, you should, once you spend 3% of your gross income in a year on the medication, you should be eligible for free drug beyond that. That's something I picked up from um, one of our um, uh, our medication uh, people at our at my hospital, and that's been helpful to a few patients. 
Um, is that for AL amyloidosis or is that only for people that also have multiple myeloma as the diagnosis? Well, in this case, it's, it's, it's cell gene um, who makes pomalidomide. So they, they will extend a uh, free drug to patients who have already spent 3% of their income on their drug. Whether they have AL amyloidosis or also multiple myeloma. Uh, that's my under, that would be my guess, but, but no, I, 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 I guess I can't be a hundred percent confident of that. That would be something, but it would be something worth checking. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay. And then we have, uh, he, here's a question. Uh, one of the greatest difficulties with this disease is coping with the high degree of uncertainty about the future. I'm a recent AL diagnosis and a recent retiree. Nothing about the future now feels like I had hoped for. Any ideas on how best to focus only in the present? I'm still in treatment, so I'm dealing with multiple symptoms and side effects as well. And um, uh, we'll start with Dr. McMahon. Why don't we, why don't we go with you on this? Um, I would imagine many of our patients feel like they worked all their lives and, and they're not, they haven't, because of this disease, they're not living the life they thought they were going to and worked so hard to achieve. Yeah, yeah, we do um, very commonly see that. Um, and it, it is very challenging. Um, I, I have a lot of patients that I work with, um, you know, have have many of these same concerns about the worries about the future of what's, what's going to happen next. Um, and, you know, that's something to be explored, I think, often with, with one of their providers one-on-one -on -one and, and, and often like a therapy session. Um, many of the times we recommend things like um, practicing mindfulness techniques, um, which is something you can talk to, you know, your provider about. And people um, find things like, uh, you know, meditation or mindfulness techniques um, as ways to kind of practice uh, living in, in the moment. And focusing on the presence um, and it's a way to kind of help your mind focusing on the, on the here and now. Um, that in conjunction I think with um, you know talking to your provider about the ways that you're feeling um, and um, in your unique situation um, kind of in, con in conjunction with working someone on some of these skills like outside of um, outside of your um, meetings with your provider, I think can be helpful. Um, but that is a very challenging thing that we often see with many patients. Um, and we often will, you know, look back on, you know, say other situations that you've come across in your life in the past that have been very challenging. Um, what has been helpful for you to cope in the past? Um, what, what has been less helpful? How did you manage that situation? Um, and and utilize some of those techniques that you used previously to kind of address how, how you're feeling now as well. Well, you bring up techniques and, and I know we, we did a little mini poll with our patients on, on techniques. Uh, Exercise and prayer seem to be the two biggest things. We, we uh, uh, but there were some that did Tai Chi and some that did uh, Reiki and, and various types of mindfulness and things like that. Is there anything that you tend to recommend to patients over something else? Um, you know, I think it's really personal and different patients like different um, things. Um, and so I, I think I would recommend really exploring what works for you. Um, sometimes people like, you know, simple breathing exercises, um, you know, such as, you know, breathing in through your nose, breathing out through your mouth, trying that a few times. Sometimes people have certain um, imagery exercises they like. Some people, like you said, like exercise a little bit more, something a little bit more active. Um, and I think that, you know, with time and, and practice, you kind of have to see what fits best for you. Um, and one thing I often, you know, say is to, you know, give it time and, um, uh, give it a, um, 
often people will do say certain times of the day, like, you know, right, right when they wake up or right before they go to bed um, and practice what's helpful for you and, you know, have this be part of your routine. Um, when you have it be part of your routine at, at um, times when maybe even you're feeling calm or feeling okay, um, then those techniques tend to be easier to use at other times when you're feeling a, a more stressed or more anxious. Thank you. Um, we're going to run on to the next question because we've got a lot of them. Can I just say I one thing? Oh, sure. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in addition to what Jen just pointed out, which is crucial, uh, for the person who asked that question, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but the time that you truly grow in your life comes from chaos. Everything falls apart in your life. Everything changes. Uh, what was solid is not solid anymore. And all I can tell you, and you all may have that experience who've been through this, is that you truly do change as a person. Your priorities change. What you're looking for in life changes. And I'm just saying that in a positive way. So as you're going through the chaos, don't do it alone. It's scary. But keep in mind, you do change in a positive way. And I just wanted to say that. Thank and you. Muriel, could I uh, piggyback on that a little bit? Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> shared grief is always much easier to bear when you're alone with it. So like when it becomes, I'm suggesting this, if it becomes apparent that, you know, you, as Dr. Baron Baum said, you know, your life is changing. And if, and if, be, if it becomes apparent that you're not gonna be able to do all the things you used to do, um, especially if you have a partner, a spouse, it's rather than avoid all that or avoid talking about it or trying to stuff it down, talk about it, like reminisce, you know, remember I could do this, remember we used to do this together, you know, and like sit close with your spouse and reminisce. And these are the good times we had. We're so great. Let's be grateful or I'm grateful for these wonderful times we had, we shared all the things you could do, things I could do, things we did together. Wow, we're fortunate to have had these experiences. Things are different now. We may never do some of those things again. I feel kind of sad about that, but you know, we still have each other. We still have today. We have some tomorrows. You know, it's like all about acceptance and sharing that, that grief together makes it easier to accept things and go forward. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for bringing up gratitude because I think being grateful is something that we need to be reminded of. It's really hard sometimes, I know. I know the Mayo Clinic does a whole session on that and, and it's really interesting. Um, anyone else wanna put in two cents here before we go on? Okay, um, this gentleman says, can you provide a reference for the study that found depression and anxiety? I'm, I didn't know there was such a study. D Dr. Berenbaum, can yeah, you? Yeah, we had one uh, that's public. I'll be glad to uh, get it to you, Muriel, and uh, hopefully you can pass it on. Oh, super, thank you so much, that's wonderful. Okay, um, oh, Dr. Berenbaum, here's another one for you. Please define the difference between anxiety and depression. Do they overlap or are they distinctly different? And, you know, we didn't go through the, de the definitions of all these things. So this is a good opportunity, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think more commonly than ever, uh, you know, there's a kind of funny name we have within psychiatry, MAD, uh, mixed anxiety, depression. Doesn't mean you're mad. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that we see a lot of overlapping between the two. Uh, I think the key point about depression, as I was talking about the other entities before, is that's a point when we define depression is really where there is no hope. Uh, people want to give up and it begins to interfere with their role in life, their activities, let alone 
and I'm sure Dr. Sher at times has seen this, can interfere with their ability to be compliant with treatment or follow through with treatment. Uh, and it becomes a, a real danger and self-destructive. And uh, that's when you begin to think about depression in that way, let alone uh, symptoms that can overlap sometimes with the somatic symptoms of the disease itself, fatigue, uh, loss of interest in things, less ability to be active in some ways too. Um, and anxiety, you know, is a useful signal that we all have. It kind of alerts us to the environment. You worry about anxiety when it begins also to interfere with your, your life. And you, you know, you become preoccupied, you're ruminating, uh, you're no longer able to concentrate and focus on the things that you'd like to do. Uh, so that's a little, you do see the overlap quite a bit. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have an, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, here's one actually from one of our pharma people. Uh, Nico, well, it might be different where, where you are because you seem to meet all your patients. But how, uh, how often do patients get connected to a social worker and how do, the, how do they connect with each other? Um, well, I think, I think you do a great job of connecting patients with each other. Um, within, within the hospital, I mean, I can talk about our particular hospital and connecting amyloidosis patients with each other. Um, but uh, it'll be different at, within uh, other different hospitals. Um, I think outside of the hospital, something that's available to everybody is, you know, the, your services and, and your Facebook group. And um, uh, I, I just got a call um, yesterday from a patient who was diagnosed a year ago and, and looking for some, some way to connect to people. And, and uh, I let them know about your Facebook group and you and, and this organization. Um, but I, th I think Huntsman is, is more advanced. Dr. Cher at Mayo in Jacksonville, do you automatically connect people with social workers like Nico when, when they're diagnosed or, or is that something you wait until they ask or how does that work? Right, so we, uh, as part of our, the practice currently, um, mural is two ways. So complex patients, especially newly diagnosed who need multiple specialty care. So we have them seen in our multi-specialty amyloid clinic where they're seen by me, cardiologists, nephrologists at the same time with neurologists available very soon if something needs to be done. And um, our nurse navigator does a very good job in discussing different needs of the patients and we connect them with the social workers. So it's a case by case basis. Not everybody needs all the resources or all the help. So we try to um, address needs of the patients depending upon the individual needs. Okay. Anyone want to add to that? When, and Paula's put some more information in the chat for people uh, for financial aid. Thank you, Paula. We appreciate it. My AL group gives medical support only. Some members want emotional support. I'm, uh, I don't understand the, the letters, the LMHC in, w, in Washington, I guess. I'm an LMHC and would like to start a support group, but not as a clinician as I need emotional support after dealing with AL and dialysis for about 10 years. Or, well, I can give them help on starting a support group later, so I will, I will be in touch with that person. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Cher, is amyloidosis truly terminal? Well, this is a, it's again a, I think it's a question of mindset. Uh, the, the word terminal, if we believe that this is what uh, that means I don't do anything about it. No, absolutely not. Uh, you know, we all live with uh, diseases like hypertension. We all live with disease like diabetes, you know, very common. One in two Americans have those common chronic conditions. Uh, they have their own journey, you know, they can lead to certain complications and they can have different outcomes. Uh, but my one liner for amyloid is no, amyloid should not be considered terminal. Uh, we've had patients 
with AL amyloid, you know, which we all know is the most aggressive type, uh, living 30, 40 years in uh, remission, or uh, those who have their disease come back, we treat them, they do okay. Now, not everybody uh, is in the same page, but vast majority, I would say the 99% of amyloid patients, including those with advanced AL, get help by the treatment. And sometimes those uh, benefits are uh, very significant. So I would not consider or approach this condition as something terminal and I give up. No, I would say that, you know, this is part of our life and we will deal with it. We have good tools. And, you know, this um, meetings like these, they, they uh, uh, provide remarkable opportunity for us to deal with the emotional side or the suffering side of uh, this disease as well. So I think, no, uh, I wouldn't consider it terminal in that sense. Thank you. C can I ask all of our panelists to, you know, put their, you know, their videos on? I think our, our, our patients all want to see how wonderful you look, for lack of a better word. Okay. Um, here's a question. I feel like this disease is killing all parts of my body. I feel like I need help. Now, I would imagine their help would not be necessarily medical. They're, 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 I don't really know, understand the question a whole lot, but all right, we'll start with you, um, Dr. Sher. Do, do people just come to you and say, this disease is killing all parts of my body, help me? And they don't really necessarily mean, you know, medical help, they just need help. Right. Say to them. I, I think this, this brings out an important question that there is a concept of pain um, and there is a concept of suffering. So we need to clarify when we see patients that what, what, what is the issue? If there is a physical pain component, we can deal with almost all, anything, you know, the uh, support group, uh, the supportive care, um, and they don't like to be called that way, the palliative care group, uh, you know, they have a lot of uh, tools to help offer and deal with a lot of those symptoms. The emotional and the suffering part of that, you know, again, uh, we all talked about many of these tools. We can do a lot to help people deal with that aspect too. Loneliness, for example, you know, uh, one of uh, colleagues mentioned, you know, we have looked at our patients uh, who have, uh, th these are hundreds and thousands of patients with different illnesses, cardiovascular illnesses, uh, end stage heart failure from different causes, COPD, lung disease, um, different cancers. You know, we accounted for multiple variables, you know, in the blood test, in the physical examination, on x-rays and CT scans. One of the ones which truly stood up as the very important predictor of survival and outcomes was actually the question whether you live alone or with somebody. So there have been studies done in 1980s and 90s, which have come up with the, the impact, you know, uh, scoring as to translating what this symptom or this risk means. Uh, loneliness in patients with acute heart attack, myocardial infarction, came up almost as deleterious as smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. So, you know, we, we tend to underestimate the impact of these. We, we are all, you know, touchy-feely human beings. We, we need people. So having support and having being able to connect and share and learn, I think that does a lot to um, minimize the burden of the disease and its treatment. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to add to that? I just want to add that, Dr. Sher, uh, we're ready to have you join psychiatry anytime. <laughs> I love what you say. Uh, I, I think the integration, you know, it's not one or the other. It's one person, you put it together. There, there's a classic paper that I give out to people called The Nature of Suffering, written years ago by Eric Cassell in New York. And he looked at suffering and what it meant, and it really affects the integrity of the person, who the person is. And obviously, disease affects that sense of who we are. And again, not doing it alone, being with others, uh, sharing your suffering, not suffering alone, as Dr. Shara said, that's the crucial thing. If there's any message I wanna have people keep in mind is to think of that. 
you know, it's interesting that you say that. Thank you. We, after our face-to-face -face meetings, we pass out evaluation sheets for, and we always bring in guest doctors to our face-to-face -face meetings. And Dr. Sher has been kind enough to guest at many of our Florida meetings and Dallas meetings. And I think he was at a New York meeting once. So he, he he's traveled for us. And uh, so we actually tallied up the votes on who was the most caring uh Amyloid, we call them amyloidologists, uh, that, that they ever had at a meeting. And the two that stood out the most was Angela Dispensieri from the Mayo Clinic and Timer Share from the Mayo Clinic. So I thought that was very interesting. So you can see why we asked him to be a guest today. So thank you so much. Um, okay, uh, okay, um, okay, that's okay. Uh, uh, a lot of medical questions here, so I'm trying to wade through them. Okay, uh, re with regards to earthing, this is a term I'm not familiar with. Do any of the doctors recommend or use this technique? Earthing, E-A-R-T-H-I-N-G. Does anyone know what it means? Well, do we all have to Google it? Okay. No, I don't. I think I'll uh, request Dr. Berenbaum with his experience if he has come across any. No, that, that's a new new one to me, and I won't blame my old age to that. So uh, I'd no, love to I'm learn more about it. Either. How about you, Jen? I, no, yeah, that's a, it's not really something I'm familiar with either, unfortunately. Okay, so here's someone. I'm a 70-year-old hereditary uh, TTR survivor. I had a heart and liver transplant in 2008, a very successful outcome. I believe I've handled my uh, citation well, except for the neuropathy that developed seven years post-transplant. I'm now starting to wane towards giving up as I have lost a lot of mobility. I feel like a couch potato these days and a burden to my spouse who is my caregiver. I've lost my motivation due to bodily fatigue. I would imagine, uh, Dr. McMahon, we, we see that rather often where people have lost their motivation due to fatigue. Do you have any recommendations there? Yeah, I mean, I think that gets to a lot of what we were talking about previously of, you know, a, a lot of this is, um, often linked with your, your medical illness and, and um, how you're, you're physically feeling. Um, but then these symptoms can also, um, you know, be worsened if you're also, you know, having a lot of uh, kind of emotional distress with um, depression as well. And so sometimes, um, you know, it's difficult to see what's impacting which um, and addressing both like we were we talking about and exploring a little bit more and, you know, how much is, is your mood a, a part of this um, can be um, something to explore a little bit more with your provider and tease out. Um, I think uh, also the comment about, you know, the, the feeling of being a burden on the caregiver is something really um, that comes up a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, um, Maybe Bob, David, want to speak a little bit more about the caregiver things. I think that helps. That 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 might be very helpful, and I think that comes up for many patients too. And and the worries about feeling like a burden. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. You know, here's here, the next question. Uh, is this, the subject is eating, and and this is a personal one for me. When I was a caregiver back in the dark ages of the 1990s and early 2000s. My patient was on a diet due to dialysis, and I had to really watch tomatoes and all, all his favorite foods, you know, sodium, etc. And I lost my patient, which people did often back then in the dark ages. And to this day, I have guilt about not allowing my patient to eat certain foods. Uh, I, I feel like I really ruined his quality of life. And, and, and sometimes I actually have crying jags about the food thing. So let me read you this next. You can help me in a separate session, but let me, um, let me read this question. I have a family member who has this disease and one of the ways they cope is by eating. They tend to eat junk food, salty foods and snacks. What is a way I can help them to stay away from those unhealthy choices of foods or is there a low sodium diet they can follow? I, I, we won't discuss diet here because we can give this person lots of diet suggestions, but do we, 
and since I faced that too, with him wanting to eat certain foods that were not necessarily right for him, what's the best way to handle this? And let's run through all of you, because I'm sure you've all had to face this. Uh, Dr. McMahon? Uh, I, yeah, I, I think it can be really challenging um, when you're, you know, you're seeing somebody else, you know, maybe make, not make the choices you would, you would want them to. And I think a lot of times what we do as providers is kind of talk to them a little bit about their thoughts and feelings about, you know, these choices and, and what's kind of motivating them behind it. And, you know, talking to, to your family member um, who's, you know, maybe eating this way um, and exploring a little bit more with them about how they feel or, or um, you know, what they would like to do or what they would be motivated in terms of, um, you know, are they interested in changing um, their habits um, and kind of having a, a discussion with them about their thoughts and feelings regarding that. Robert, I'd like to hear your uh, opinion on this because I know you deal with a lot of caregivers in, in your support groups. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think that principle, again, of respecting independence always has to be held up. Um, of course, the caregiver has ideas about what's best and what's healthy. Um, I think it's good for both the patient and the caregiver to, you know, to attend whatever sessions where diet and nutrition is discussed and what have you, so you both understand, and then you have a conversation about it. But it's the patient's job to heal. It's not the caregiver's job to heal the patient. So it's, you know, I think as a caregiver, you can make suggestions, you can say, you know, remember such and such, whatever, but also have to step back and say, you know, you're the one going through this. I know how you feel badly. Um, I support you and I'm gonna trust your decisions. Um, you know, and the, the point is, adding a dynamic of contention and maybe guilt on the part of the patient for doing things that part of them knows isn't the right thing, but they don't need to be told it all the time. You know, uh, it's really what ultimately is more constructive. And because a patient, I guess I, I, it's easier for me to think in terms of when the patient doesn't want to eat or doesn't want to drink and the caregiver says, hey, you got to do this to keep up your strength and what have you. It's like, well, you know, if the patient really does is feeling badly, doesn't want to do it, then you know they're not going to. It's not going to affect their health seriously if they miss one portion of such and such or one quantity of liquid or something. Um, it's it has to always be a message that's supportive. You know, okay, I know you don't feel well. Um, you know, tomorrow's another day. I just respect you, and um, you know, I care for you, and I'm going to do everything I can to help you and I trust your decisions. Thank you. Dr. Berenbaum? Yeah, I, I think Bob is making a real good point that it shouldn't be a struggle. Uh, just keep in mind things like that, food, alcohol, you name it, are just the tip of the iceberg. It's really what's under the water. And if you think about it, uh, when you're going, it's sort of like one of the questions that was asked, you know, there's a tremendous loss of control in your life. And uh, what can I control? Can I tr control what I eat? Can I control those things? Uh, and it's really helping maybe the patient to talk a little more about what they're trying to control, what they've lost. Uh, in other words, what's underneath all of it and finding a balance. Uh, boy, you know, when I'm under a lot of stress, I, I think of Dunkin' Donuts and that helps me at that moment. So. Uh, you can identify with it, but, but you're right. You need to see what else is going on. Okay. Nico, anything else? For yeah, I, I think we, I think we uh, in COVID, we've seen kind of a similar uh, um, balancing acts with um, even just visiting family. Um, you know, I, I know that it's tricky for me to visit my grandchildren, um, and, uh, you know, some people, I, th I think, make the judgment that, um, you know, any kind of social contact that they can possibly avoid um, is, you know, in the interest, it's in the interest of their health to, to do this. And then some other 
patients um, and families make the judgment that, you know, I'm going to be smart about wearing masks, maybe meeting outside if possible and, and doing things, but I'm also going to uh, accept a little bit of risk and, and see my family. And, and, and that's, and that's important enough to me um, to sort of counter the, um, the additional risk that I'm bringing on myself by, uh, you know, choosing to meet with my grandchildren. Thank you. Um, well, we have two people that have helped us with the earthing uh, thing here. Okay. Um, earthing appears to be connected with the, you're connected with the earth by standing barefoot on the soil, connecting the human body to the earth's surface electrons. Well, would that be like when you go to Sedona and you feel the power of, uh, uh, well, help me here, folks. Uh, I'm, I'm not up on this, but have you heard anything about being in touch with nature, barefoot on the ground, hugging a tree, whatever? Nope. I'm not familiar with that, although I, I feel like if somebody finds something like that helpful to them in, in terms of connecting to nature, that and if somebody personally finds that way to, you know, cope, then, then it may be helpful. Um, I'm just not, I'm not personally too familiar with that technique. Okay, well, maybe we'll see an article written on it soon, okay? And then and then we'll never know, right? Uh, we have a lot more questions, but I know you, our, we have to finish at 1230. So what we'll do is we'll save Jennifer's uh, from NAMI, her presentation until 1230, okay? So we'll have that because we need to hear about the resources that are available um, for our people. So everyone stay tuned at 1230, we'll show that because we want to continue answering the questions right now. Um, and Dr. Sher, here's a question, and, and this person was specific, they were concerned about side effects of one particular drug for nerve pain, but it goes to a bigger question, I think, which is fear of side effects of a drug, just like people are afraid of the side effects of the COVID vaccine, fear of side effects of the drug. Do you see that uh, impairing people getting treatment because they, and, and how, do you, uh, how do you handle that when people are afraid about side effects to certain treatments and certain drugs. Right, right. No, I think that that's a very important question and a little bit tying into the question in terms of diet and those things too. What I, at, at least I have personally perceived that if human beings, if we are told to be afraid of something or be fearful of something, we will be fearful of that. So uh, we probably perform much better with uh, being empowered. You know, so if I have to make a choice out of fear, I don't think that's going to be a long lasting choice. If, uh, on the other hand, if I'm empowered and I'm able to make that decision more consciously. So the only thing that helps there is knowledge. So dealing with side effects and those things, what I typically do in my practice is that we have a education session with the patients. Uh, so specifically, let's say we are changing a treatment regimen. Uh, either a nurse um, or a chemotherapy specialized nurse or physician or a nurse practitioner, we go over the treatment and what to expect, what not to expect. So the more people are prepared in advance, I think the better they can handle some of these things. That's one. Second, in terms of overall side effect, the intensity and profundity of these effects, this toxicity is declining significantly. So for example, the current frontline treatment for AL amyloid is nowhere near what it used to be about 10, 15 years ago. So when even taking a medicine like dexamethasone, uh, not in the best way, people would end up in the hospital with heart failure. So now we know how to best take this drug. People do okay. There is no weight gain. They, they, they manage these things very well. Neuropathy is relatively common from different drugs, but there are plenty of ways we can deal with it. And I think this is where a multi-specialty approach, especially with you know, involving our uh, psychiatry colleagues is important because some of the medications that they use to manage these mood and de depressive symptoms can actually be a good tool for us to manage neuropathy or uh, some of the other side effects, weight loss, for example, uh, that happens in these patients. 
So I think, you know, symptom management is a complex issue for these patients. Everybody recognizes it. Uh, but working together uh, as a team, we can approach a lot of these, uh, uh, these issues. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do want to say we have a lot of questions that, that really don't come under the topic we're discussing today. So if you don't get an answer to one of your questions and, it really, and you really would like it, send me an email with that question and I will send it to the appropriate doctor to get an answer for you. Because I do want all your answers questions answered today. It's just some of them don't, you know, quite fit under today's umbrella. Okay. Um, so let's, let's get on the subject of physical pain. We, we, we have a lot of people that have told us that their doctors don't believe they really have pain. Their doctors question it. They're concerned their doctors don't handle it properly. Uh, Dr. Sher, do you have, do you have that issue with some of your patients? Uh, so I, I think it's again a matter, there are two issues. One is uh, not everybody is very well trained in dealing with complex pain. Uh, that's one aspect. The other piece of the puzzle I would tell you is what's happening in the society in general with the opioid crisis in the last three, four, five years that have unfolded, that have changed the practice of medicine. Uh, for And it, it's tough to say that, you know, what impact it has on patients, but I can tell you people are um, hesitant to prescribe some of the pain medications, especially non-oncologists. Uh, third part, I think, again, uh, I'm a little bit biased in this sense, but as a system, as a society, you know, the healthcare has certain issues. For example, if you look at the data, the average time an oncologist spends in the United States with the patient in the first encounter, first one or two encounter, uh, where they talk about the disease, the diagnosis and everything is 17 minutes. So, you, you know, this is, it's pretty astounding. So there are multiple aspects to that. Um, but to, to come to the point of understanding and managing pain, no, uh, we, we all recognize, especially the amyloidologist, as you say, that this is a disease of profound suffering. Um, but having said that, there are lots of opportunities. I think if you go to a place where there is not a specialized center, it's okay to ask that, can you please refer me to a palliative care physician? Because one of the things that comes to mind is the moment we use the word palliation, our brain shuts down, that it means I'm giving up on treatment, no. So it doesn't in any way stop you from getting treatment for AL for that matter or heart failure from other types of amyloids, but those resources can help you tremendously. There is a separate specialized trained palliative care fellowship where people deal with these very complex issues. So uh, we, we need to be very open in discussing and approaching this with our uh, primary teams. Thank you. You bring up a really good point because I hear a lot of people when they hear palliative care, they're thinking hospice, which of course is a totally different thing. So I'm glad you clarified that. That's really important. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to answer one more question. Then I'm going to ask all of you to say a few words to our audience. And then after that, we'll play Jessica Edwards' uh, information about resources. Okay, so here's the one last question, which I think is really an important one. Uh, as a wild type patient, I'm finding that if I avoid antidepressant medication, I feel much better with a lot less side effects such as frequent urination at night, many naps during the day, and fatigue, uh, and I feel almost normal. I also made peace with the Lord and made my final funeral and estate planning arrangements for my family. It's given me a sense of freedom. I, too, want to stretch my wings now and want to ride horses at age 73. My wife thinks I'm nuts. I know that I'm very, very fortunate. So I'll ask all of you to make a comment about that as you as you as you bid the audience farewell and, and, and then we'll listen to Jessica's presentation. And I just wanna thank you all so very much. This has meant so much to so many. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go first if that's okay. Go, ahead, go for it. I love that last uh, comment question. That was wonderful. And um, I kind of wanna tie that into my last comment, which is um, staying connected and talking about your illness with other people who are going through it is a realistic way to handle it. Um, 
staying kind of shut in and woe is me and self-absorbed is the more unrealistic way to handle it. The fact is it's a big part of one's life, but it's not one's entire life. So talking about it and also, you know, doing going about your other business in life is important. Um, you know, it's been touched on earlier about the importance of connecting with others. One of the things I say in support group meetings periodically, be it cancer or amyloidosis, the fact that you come to a meeting says more about your healing process than anything you're going to actually get from the meeting itself, because it's saying you accept the disease to a certain extent, you recognize others have it, have it, you want to talk about it, you want to share with others, you want to hear what others have to say, you're in a position where you can be helpful to others, you're willing to receive help from others. So just the act of showing up um, is kind of a reflection of a healthy or healthier attitude. So um, I just in, always encourage people, you know, just come to a group and talk to other people, be it online, be it, you know, in person is always better. But, you know, if you can't do that, then online, Zoom, whatever, it's fine. Thanks. And thanks for this opportunity. Oh, we really enjoyed having you. Thank you so much. Uh, next. Yeah, I, I, I just, Muriel, I love that story. Uh, I guess I said earlier, uh, when I listen to the stories from the amyloid patients, I just remark about their courage and their resilience. And I think that story illustrates that. And I think it gives hope, I, I imagine, uh, to all of you. Uh, as, as Bob said, uh, maintaining that connection, seeing that there are opportunities in life, uh, and making sure you ask for help. Don't feel guilty uh, about this disease and uh, guilty about how it's impacting other people. People want to be there and help you. And uh, I just wish this guy has a wonderful ride on that horse and, and enjoys it. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone else next? Nico? Um, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I thought it was interesting. He, he talked about the freedom he got from making funeral arrangements. Um, that's not something that I would expect most people to um, voice, but um, it does illustrate kind of an, uh, you know, the usefulness of an approach that is common, uh, I think, among all mental health professionals. Um, and, and, that, and that's sort of identifying what is, um, what the, what the, what's helpful to the patient. What, I mean, to, to have the patient sort of identify, you know, the patient is the best expert on what's helpful to them. And um, we as social workers can be of service, um, not necessarily by talking at them about what's helpful, but by talking with them and, and kind of identifying from themselves, um, having that come out. Um, and uh, the fact that he identified that and, um, and that did prove helpful, I think it was really um, uh, interest, instructive. So. I, th I think it was something maybe that he has control over. You know, we, but sometimes as patients, they, we don't feel that we necessarily have control over things. And, and also it's kind of a tying up loose ends situation. So you can, you can, you know, you can kind of relax and go on to the next thing. It, it, it is interesting. Thank you for joining us, Nico. I, I know all of our patients wish all of you were at their local center. Uh, Dr. McMahon, we'll take you next. Yeah, I, I really um, appreciate that that last comment as well, um, and I, I, you know, appreciate the highlighting of the medication too. And like Nico said, it's a very personal decision. Um, you know, I, sometimes people find medication very helpful for them, and and some people. Um, you know, decide it's not for them. And at, at the end of the day, like we were discussing, it's a, it's a very personal decision. Um, and I also would just want to echo um, Dr. Barry mom and saying, you know, don't be afraid to, to reach out for help and have, the, have these sorts of discussions with, with your provider. Um, otherwise, thank you for having me and thank you for, for the great questions. Oh, thank you for joining us.
again, we'd like to clone all of you and send you to every one of our centers, but you know, they may have people like you there. We don't know. And hopefully they'll come out of the woodwork now and we'll hear about that. And won't that be wonderful? Okay. Have we heard from everyone now? Okay, um, if you can stay with us, that would be great to hear this. this and if not, we, you know, this, this will be up on our website and our, on our YouTube page uh, in, in a couple of weeks and, and we'll be able to, but we will be able to share the NAMI uh, resources that Jessica Edwards will be giving us so that you'll have them for your patients and as well. And we thank you all for joining us. So, and remember anyone that's going to leave, we do have a survey that we definitely want you to fill out. So right now let's, let's hear from Jessica Edwards, okay? Hello, my name is Jessica Edwards and I work for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Thank you so much for having me today. And I wish I could be with you live in person. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about NAMI and our resources and how chronic uh, physical diagnoses intersect our mental health. Um, I work for NAMI National. We also have 48 state organizations and 600 local affiliates across the country. So if you're interested in learning more about NAMI, I would encourage you to go to our website, www.nami.org, um, and find a local organization in your community. Uh, mental health affects everyone. One in five Americans experience a mental health condition each year. Mental health conditions can often be exacerbated by a difficult chronic diagnosis. Um, grief and shock, anger and frustration, disappointment, invalidation, jealousy, fear, sadness, all of these feelings can often accompany that diagnosis and can contribute negatively to your mental health. It's sometimes difficult to know if you're having a rough day or a rough couple of days versus there's something more serious going on with your mental health. And we typically help identify that if the symptoms are um, persistent and chronic. So a rough couple of days, maybe nothing to worry about, but if you're having a struggle for more than two weeks, you should probably seek um, some mental health professional care and see if you can't get and address um, what's going on. Some other warning could be feeling very sad or withdrawn for more than two weeks. Um, excessive use of drugs and alcohol can be a sign. Drastic changes in your mood, behavior, personality, sleeping and eating habits. Um, difficulty concentrating, intense worries or fears, and severe out of control um, anxiety. If you have trouble catching your breath, that can also be a sign that something more serious is going on. Um, NAMI is here to help on any part of your mental health journey. Our website is a wealth of resources. I'm going to share some resources with the folks running this call that they can provide to you as well. And also our helpline. Our helpline is open from Monday through Friday from 10 to 8 Eastern. And that number is 1-800-950-NAMI, which is 6264. Um, the helpline can help give you ideas about where to look if you're not sure how to find a provider, if you're um, wanting to get some peer support and understand what other people may be going through. All of NAMI's programs and support groups are peer led, nothing about us without us. So everyone is um, led by someone who has a mental health condition or is a family member of someone who has a mental health condition. It can be very difficult living with a chronic diagnosis and taking care of your mental health alongside your other physical challenges is essential to overall wellness and thriving. The same is true for caregivers. You have to make sure, um, what is the saying? You can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to make sure that your cup is full and that you're taking care of yourself in order to be the best caretaker possible for your loved one. And addressing your mental health and your stress and your anxiety um, and depression through very challenging times to navigate is a critical part to make sure that everyone in your family and in your life stays well so that you can, um, so that you can be the best possible version of yourself. And, and taking care of our mental health is something we don't always talk about because it can be difficult and it can be stigmatizing and it can feel like one more thing. But I'm here today to tell you that you are not alone that if you're struggling or um, want to seek some support or care or resources, that NAMI is here for you. And I would really encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, again, my name is Jessica, and I welcome any uh, questions or, or inquiries to my email at jedwards at nami.org. 
And then, um, like I said, there's some resources on our website and, and after this presentation, if you need anything at all. So thank you for having me today. I wish I could be with you live and I hope you enjoy the rest of your session. Take care. Hey, thank you, everyone. We uh, we will be sending out an email with, with information um, that has been covered, you know, where we promised you information. You can send me an email or info at emilydosensupport.org if you have any questions that, you know, you would like to see answered. Again, this will be up on our YouTube channel. It will be up on our website in about two weeks. We'll all announce all of our future webinars the usual way on our website, on our Facebook groups. They have one amyloid dose of voice. And, um, and I, don't, I think Bob's gonna start arranging it so that the YouTube channel um, starts putting out announcements as well. There's some way to do that, I guess. So we thank you all so much. It, this meant so much. This was a little different for us. This is not our usual thing. And I can't wait to see the results of the survey after the meeting to see if you want more uh, meetings like this. So take care, everyone, and have a great day and a great weekend. Bye-bye.